let's talk about access to vaccines, about vaccine nationalism. Um, for poor and developing countries, uh, South Africa is not a poor developing country, but within that realm of all of Africa. If we do not uh, provide protection, we could be housing these incubations of mutations for a long time. So the short-sightedness of uh, this um, vaccine nationalism of uh, countries like yourselves not having access to adequate amount or frankly even generating your own supply. Let's speak a little bit about that and what are your concerns around that, uh, Shibi? I think that's absolutely correct. Uh, the more people that only, the greater the number of the population that has only got partial immunity, the greater the likelihood that the virus is going to have opportunities to mutate and cause a problem uh, throughout the world. I think it would be naive to believe, as we've learned simply from the virus that started off in China, that the virus are going to respect any sort of geographic boundaries. Uh, the reality is that unless uh, the world is prepared to shut down the whole of Africa as well as Latin America very soon, considering how widespread the P1 variant in uh, Brazil is becoming, uh, there's going to be human traffic between countries. Uh, so unless we can get on top of uh, this virus by having substantial percentages of the population vaccinated as quickly as possible, and it really has to be as quickly as possible, uh, to try to avoid the ongoing circulation of the virus, which would basically lend itself to these mutations, I think we're going to be in trouble uh, throughout the world. Yes, things might look at a, um, good at a point in time uh, in some countries that have been able to get high penetration of vaccine coverage, uh, but they're going to remain susceptible to having these sort of variants imported into their, in, into their countries eventually, uh, and they're probably going to start experiencing many outbreaks with, with this variant. So it's absolutely essential. It's not just in the interest of the low middle income countries for them to gain access to vaccine as soon as possible. It's in the interest of the global community for there to be early access, equitable access, affordable access to COVID-19 vaccines. You know, I think um, when people don't understand that what happens with a natural infection is that the, the virus has a way of creating what we call immune suppression, and as you talk, immune evasion. To the lay public, it basically tamps down the immune system so that the immunity uh, from that patient is not necessarily that strong. And then if they get another infection, they then become, as you said, an incubator. So this concept of herd immunity um, um, is a failed concept, especially now in the light of these mutations. And this is why this national uh, vi uh, vaccine nationalism is such a failed and flawed concept. Walk me through, I'm been in the last maybe four or five months communicating with uh, the leadership in South Africa, including yourselves and um, the MRC and um, elements of the government. South Africa seems to be on the forefront, um, not only of the science, on the clinical analysis, and really making impact of real information that will impact the world. One, how did that come about? Two, uh, where do you see your future uh, of, of South Africa truly being in the forefront to try and lead the world? Um, in understanding and finding a way to combat this virus? Yeah. So I think there's been a number of strengths as well as weaknesses, unfortunately, in South Africa. On the scientific front, I think building on the research that's been done around HIV, tuberculosis, in my own case, of vaccines, which is what I've been looking at for the past 25, 26 years, uh, over time, we've been able to develop expertise, which sort of allowed itself to basically redirect and repurpose uh, it's used to tackle COVID-19 as a community. And I think uh, we, there was a strong sense of collaboration within the country among scientists. And each of the scientists really sort of rose to the occasion in terms of moving it forward. Uh, we were fortunate in that there was some funds that were made available as an example by the Department of Science and Innovation, as well as the Medical Research Council, that really assisted scientists to get kickstarted with their research agendas. And like I said, the important part of it, especially as an example, when it comes to the sequencing of the virus, uh, South Africa probably was one of the top countries in terms of having a program in place right from the outset of the pandemic 
to do systematic sequencing of the virus and consequently why we were able to identify the variant as early as we did. Uh, and much probably much more a uh, much more robust system than probably that existed in the United States at a point in time. So that is some of the strengths in that we did leverage off expertise that has been built up over the past uh, two to three decades because of work in the field of HIV, because of work in the field of tuberculosis and other vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, but at the same time, there are weaknesses, and those weaknesses are not just specific to South Africa, but probably weaknesses that are throughout the African continent. And one of the major weaknesses uh, is that we don't have the capacity and capability, and we haven't actually developed it, uh, to really move to the field of uh, vaccine development from the laboratory and taking it right through to the manufacturing process and allowing for South Africa to be the suppliers of the vaccine to its own population, as well as to other countries in Africa. Unfortunately, that lack of investment is, uh, the failure of that is multifactorial. Uh, I don't think it's just government's responsibility. Yes, government needs to provide the funds to allow for the research to take place and to create an enabling environment for it to happen. But it's also unfortunately a failure of the private sector, as well as to some extent, a failure of, acad of academia. Uh, in that that hasn't really been a focus, despite the science being on the wall for decades now, uh, where South Africa needs to develop that cap capability and capacity, it simply doesn't happen when it comes to vaccine production. A good example is in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic. Uh, after the swine flu pandemic, there was a lot of political talk about ensuring that Africa becomes more sustainable and more de uh, self, uh, self, uh, more self. Uh, they become much more uh, self-liable in terms of being able to produce uh, vaccines generally. Uh, but since uh, in 2009, with the swine flu pandemic, uh, vaccines eventually did become available to Africa, but only after the pandemic had passed. Uh, and that was should have been a wake-up call. And there was political speak in terms of correcting that to increase capability when it comes to vaccine manufacture on the continent. But until today, unfortunately, there's no country on the continent that has the capacity to be able to produce, manufacture vaccines from scratch. And like I said, at a level of the science, unfortunately, we haven't taken it to that level where we can actually uh, develop these vaccines in the laboratory. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, it really shouldn't be too much of a high hurdle, a high bar to sort of clear. We've seen a number of institutions, uh, we know there's probably about 240 vaccines that are either in clinical or preclinical development. Uh, but there has been a systematic failure on the continent, including in South Africa, when it comes to actual vaccine uh, discovery, as well as development. And unfortunately, when it comes to manufacture, uh, that is a challenge which we need to address and we should have addressed uh, probably a decade ago.